let me let me introduce Mary Miller, uh, who came here from <laughs> Great Britain. Uh, <laughs> and sh she's a professor emeritus of sociology, sociology at uh, University of Northumbria in Newcastle, and she's uh, she's field, her field of research is uh, mainly alternative economic systems and also monetary reform and uh, ecofeminism. Um, she has written several books, including The Future of Money, and now she's working on uh, another book entitled Debt or Democracy. So welcome. It's Hi. nice to have you here. And I will, now we'll, I will just give you the floor. Um, yeah, so that was a sh short introduction. What? To wait until people have settled down, or mm -hmm. just give it a couple of minutes. Yeah, just. Okay. okay. So I can think right. we can start. Um, thank you for inviting me. C can you can you hear me all right? Okay. Uh, do you want me to talk with that one? Or, I mean, or, or if this one is picking up okay. Okay, it's easier, then I can wave my hands around. Um, after all, you know, people can't speak unless they wave their hands around. Um, just a few points of uh, sort of in introduction. First of all, thanks for inviting me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very glad to be here, and I'm very interested in your response to what I have to say. Um, I understand this set of lectures this year is about non-orthodox eco economics, so I, I fit the bill on that. Um, you, um, I was asked to talk from an eco-feminist standpoint, so I will be starting with an eco-feminist standpoint and um, explaining the importance of the link between women and nature uh, that I want to talk about and why that's important. Um, and my, my, the, the other thing I was asked to do was to talk about how we might take account of women and nature in the economy. And my proposal to do that is to do with reform of the money system. So uh, the, the second part of my talk is to try to explain uh, my position, my n uh, heterodox, non-orthodox position on the money system. Basically, um, I don't think economists and certainly politicians understand what money is and they don't understand what money systems are. And I think once we understand what they are, we can begin to use them very creatively and very uh, democratically to achieve the ends we want. Uh, the aim, my aim, and I dare say it's the aim of everybody in the audience, is that I want a, a, an economy that's based on sufficiency that is enough for everybody, but not too much for some and not enough for others. So I'm trying to find an economy that would allow people to live safely and securely, but and a lot of people talk about a degrowth society. Basically, we've got to have a sustainable economy that's ecologically sustainable and socially just, and that's what I call a sufficiency economy, an economy that is enough. And uh, as I say, my solution is democratization of money, and that's a giveaway in the title. So, uh, um, so let, let me introduce, uh, first of all, start then with my, with my analysis in ecofeminism. Ecofeminism, uh, how many people here are familiar with the concept of ecofeminism? One or two. Um, it's a movement that began <clears throat> roughly the same time as the, um, the, the, the rekindling of the, of the feminist movement in the 1970s and the beginning of the ecology movement also in the 1970s. The eco-feminist movement started the same time and really put the two together, put together the position of women and the position of nature in relationship to modern economies. So the whole thing is is framed around what is the economy, what is the economy um, taking account of, and what is it not taking account of. 
And the image you often have of, of Eka feminism is of people dancing around trees, usually women. But one of the first movements was the tree hugging to stop the trees being pulled down. In fact, it wasn't just women. It was presented as, as, as a feminist, Eka feminist movement, but it wasn't just women hugging the trees. This is the Chipko movement in India, one of the first movements. It was men and women hugging the trees. Now, the image when you... When you um, one image you get when we talk about ecofeminism is women caring for the world. So we have this sort of idea of woman as mother, as, as, as mother and nurturer. And women share with the planet, with, with, the, with nature, the, uh, the caring, the nourishing of people. That's one of the images. So is this coming up all right? Yes, it is. Um, so this, uh, the idea of the mother and nurturer women caring for the world, holding the world in their arms. Um, now, I don't have that rather um, uh, romantic view, I'm afraid. And my feminism is a bit more uh, hard-nosed. I see women very much not as loving, caring, nurturing, but as rather cross people saying, I'm fed up <laughs> with always having to do everything. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, so this is my image of woman and nature, both of them rather cross. Um, if, stop me if I'm using words you, you don't follow, okay? Because, um, but is everybody with me so far? Right, okay. Right, now also, I don't, I don't also share the kind of rather uh, romantic image of humans in nature harmony with nature. I see the whole relationship between humans and nature as one of struggle. Struggle not only with humanity and nature, but struggle of humans with humans in their, in their, uh, in, in their relationship to nature. So I see it as, as, as very much uh, a human dilemma. So our, our existence in nature as hum humanity is not an easy one. And this is because we... Uh, we we don't have, uh, we have only have limited choice about how we interact with nature because we're embodied. We're born in bodies and those bodies will, uh, we don't know what their bodies, those bodies are going to do, how long they're going to last, whether they're going to get sick. We can do our best, but some people can um, eat as much as they want and stay as thin as that and other people can eat reasonably and you're bigger. So, uh, you know, it, it, you can't control your body. So we, 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 we live sort of in a, in, a, in a sort of tense relationship with our bodies. Um, but also, we're embedded in nature. We live, we live as humans. We have to exist within an ecosystem. So that's our dilemma as humans. We, we're conscious beings, but we have to live within our bodies and live within nature. And therefore, this is where I see that struggle coming, that we have to relate as humans, we have to relate to nature. But it's not done just humanity to nature, it's human to human. And in, in, in a sense, in a conflict in relationship to nature, creating space for ourselves in nature. So my, my image of the relationship between humanity and nature it's not, a, it's not a comfortable one. I don't, uh, I don't see it as, as comfortable. We're always trying to work things out. Now, the thing that... Uh, let's bring us into the economy now. Um, the one thing that I think the marginalisation, the exclusion, uh, it's often called externalisation, the way that nature and women and women's work are not treated as fully valuable in the modern economy. And um, so, so, uh, what, what, so our modern economies have constructed this kind of image of, um, of somebody who, who exists almost without a body and without nature. And this, this being, yeah, I call economic man. Now, economic man can also be a woman. To live the life of economic man doesn't mean you're male. Uh, there, I mean, I live quite a life of economic man. I whiz about and do things. 
um, and uh, sometimes leave all the inconveniences of human existence to other people to clean up. I leave it to other women often to uh, back me up and my partner to back me up. <laughs> he has to get in on this. Um, so, so, so my analysis of what is wrong with the modern economy is that it's, it, it, it has an image of what people can do that isn't realistic because it doesn't take account of human bodies and doesn't take account of human embeddedness in nature. So what that means is that um, the modern economy exploits women's work, what I call women's work. It's not women as such, because there are women who are not exploited. I mean, to a certain extent, I don't think I'm particularly exploited, but many women are, and many men are exploited. So it's, it's exploiting a particular kind of work, which not all women do, but, mo but mostly it's done by women. Um, so the modern economy exploits women's work and nature's resilience. It relies on nature being able to, um, uh, to, to bear all our problems, really. So I see there's a structural relationship between gender inequality, the, particularly the way modern economies are structured with gender inequality and unsustainability. And as I've said, I, I think modern economies can only exist because they can exploit women's unpaid or underpaid work and the ability of nature to be resilient and to provide free goods and resources for the economy to take account of. So what is women's work then? And I stressed before, it's not done by all women and uh, men can do this work as well, but it's all the physical body work. It's all the caring, nurturing, nurturing emotional support. It's not, it tends to be very local work around the home, around the community. So the people who do it don't get far, far from home. It's very routine and repetitive, and I'm accounting uh, this as well as this work in subsistence uh, economies where people are growing their own food, because it's all the repetitive and routine stuff, the fetching, the weeding, the cooking, the cleaning, the grinding. The, it's, it's, it's all those things that have to be done day in, day out, day in, day out. It's also being available, being dependable, just being, being taking responsibility. And um, as I've said before, it's mainly unpaid work or it's underpaid work. If it comes into the economy, it comes into the economy um, uh, with, with, with very low wages. Now, economic man, as I've said, can also be female. Uh, this, this image of what our economies are constructed to, to think of as the typical person in the economy is somebody who's disembedded from their, their biology, the time it takes to live their biological, their bodied life. That's the daily cycle of the body, the food, the cleaning, uh, the washing of the clothes, the, the sleeping, the nurturing, uh, the emotional time. Um, and the life cycle, the, the people of the economy, they're, they're once young, they have to grow old, they may become sick, they may become unhappy. And, uh, and uh, when they are old, young, sick, unhappy, then the economy doesn't want them. The economy finds them troublesome, so they try to get rid of them. Um, and this kind of economic man who lives in the modern economy is also disembodied from the ecology, from the time it takes in ecology. For instance, from the seasons. Economic man gets food from around the world. You can get oranges any time of year, apples any time of year, vegetables any time of year. Uh, it's flown in, it's flown out, it's packaged. It doesn't take account of the time the natural world takes to replenish, to renew. It doesn't take account of the use of resources. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the depletion and destruction. So the image I'm trying to get to you then is nature, uh, nature's resilience and all the activities around the work of the body and the human life in na nature 
is ignored and excluded from the modern economy. And instead, it's all based around the image of this economic man who, who, who is never sick, never old, never young, never has dependent children, uh, never has a, a, a granny to look after. Um, they, they're just always there. They can be there on the dot um, and, uh, and able to undertake economic work. So what then we have is a gendered economics that is unsustainable. It's unsustainable. And, and it falls into a kind of dual, um, into two sort of uh, sections, really. One represented by economic man, the other one represented by the world of women's work. So on this side, we have the market, the profit-oriented, the well-rewarded, economic man with um, uh, reflecting market value, re reflecting personal wealth, as I said before, able-bodied, people who are fit, well, not too old, not too young. Um, it's people's labour, it's, it's their knowledge. IPR is intellectual property rights. Um, uh, it, the uh, exploitable natural resources, the things you can take easily out of the ground, and based around consumption and growth. And set against this are all the things that are marginalized or un unacknowledged, women's work, the work of the body, the work of the home, the work of routine activities, the world of subsistence, and this word provisioning. Provisioning is all the things we do for each other that, uh, that can be paid or unpaid. And of course, a lot of the things we do for each other are unpaid, but we still need them doing. Um, and as I've said before, the sick, the needy, the old, the young, uh, the world of the body, the world of feelings, the world of wisdom, unless it can be sold, unless it can be packaged and sold, ecosystems and wild nature, and uh, the world of needs and sufficiency. So the modern economy is representing all the values on the left, and the world I'm talking about is all the values on the right. And, uh, and this is just the, the world of modern economy, the world of economic man, and I don't know how much this is recognizable to you in Poland, uh, whether you think that you've escaped some of this, that you're, you're, you, you have a, a different kind of economy, but certainly the economy that I've come from, the British economy, or certainly the American economy, is very much built around this image of this unsustainable economic man who's always on the go, 24 hours a day, um, uh, and, uh, and doesn't have to take account of any damage and support systems. Um, so women's work in the natural environment, uh, the way the economic term for this is exter are externalized. That is, they're ignored or marginalized when we take account of formal accounts, when we take, a, when we take account of profit and loss and, and the costs of production, etc. Um, now, so the question, so obviously the, the, this has been said a lot about, well, can we find a way of valuing all this work, unpaid work that people do in the community and in the home? And can we value nature? Can we, can we, put, a, can we put a price on it? That is, can we internalize the costs? Is that sort of the solution? Just make the economy value all this stuff. And I think no, because you could think about turn, uh, linking the world, nature or women's work to some kind of income. You certainly uh, could, could think about that. The only trouble is, certainly in, in the case of nature, if you put a price on nature, then who's going to be able to pay the price? Who's going to be able to buy up nature? Well, the people who have the money already. So if you make, if you make nature marketable, put a price on it, then this is where we come to money. Because who has the money can therefore grab the resources, as they are doing anyway. So I think, I think making something a price on the market, I don't think that's any solution at all. So I don't think internalization in that terms will, will, will work because it, it, the danger is it puts nature in, in the hands of the economically powerful. And it doesn't challenge current ownership and control of natural resources. 
And it has been tried with regard to women. There was a big campaign in the 1970s when the women's movement, particularly in America, got going again. And uh, women made a, a claim for wages for housework, and there was a huge campaign for wages for housework. But the trouble is, again, who has the money to pay for wages for housework? It's assuming the people who have control already. And, uh, and it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, uh, well, it, it didn't achieve, it didn't, didn't work out. So I think what we need to do is challenge the money system itself. Challenge what money is doing in an economy. And I focus on money because money is the boundary that excludes, that, that, that prioritizes the world of economic man and excludes uh, most of what I've called women's work most of the world of the community and subsistence, and most of the damage to the ecosystem doesn't come within the boundary of the money system. So, so what I want to do is to think about what this thing called money is. And this is the sort of second half of my, um, of my talk. Uh, am I going too fast? Too slow? <laughs> too slow. No, just right. Not like that, not like that, just right. Okay, so the first thing I would do from an ecofeminist point of view is stop talking about the economy because the economy makes us think immediately of money and of uh, profit and loss. And it seems to me that a better word that uh, ecofeminists are using is the word provisioning because provisioning is all the things we need to give ourselves secure and, 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 and happy lives. It's not just what you buy in the shops or you buy in the marketplace. That is, it's all our lives. It's, our, it, it, it's the life of the body, it's the life of the environment, it's the life of the community, it's everything. So thinking in terms of breaking, the first way to break that barrier down between the valued economy, this one I'm talking about here, this dark one in the middle, this valued economy, is just to deny the word, deny the boundary itself by changing the concept of provisioning all the things we need to make our lives sustainable and socially just and secure for us. Oopsie. So this is why my aim is for what I call gender equal sufficiency provisioning because if you're provisioning at the same level that we're at now, particularly in countries like Britain and America, and most of, of, of Europe, which is very high, consumer, high consumption, well, you don't want provisioning on that scale because that is going to be ecologically destructive. So what we want is a provisioning system that, that reduces the um, overconsumption of the richer societies and the richer people in society. So we want to scale down um, and, uh, and uh, try to get um, what people need, but not, not more than they need and not less than they need. And so that's why I'm using this word provisioning, to embrace women's work and the resilience of nature. I've talked about sufficiency, this idea of enough. People always say, well, what is it? You know, how much do people need? And I think it's very difficult to, make, to, to decide what people do need. But we know too much when we see it, and we know too little when we see it. So as long as we don't think there are people with too much, and as long as we don't think we are people with too little, then probably we've got the level about right. Um, and I think we've got to think seriously about everybody having a right to livelihood, which might mean the right to meaningful work. But for other people who, who, who are too old, too young, too sick, too unhappy, or live in too difficult a, a, a part of the world, then those people have a right to livelihood. I don't know if it's happening in Poland, but in Britain, and under the austerity packages that they're talking about at the moment, there is a most terrible attack on the unemployed and the people with disabilities. There being uh, the, 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 the able-bodied workers are being stirred up by the, by the newspapers to turn on the unemployed and to turn on young people who haven't got jobs 
turn on, turn on the, 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 the people who are sick or, or have disabilities, particularly people with mental health problems, because they look as if they're fit. They're not able to work because they've got mental health problems, but they look as if they, they could be working. And it's very, very cruel. Um, we're, 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 it's a nasty, nasty situation we find ourselves in. So we have to live within our ecological means. And I would argue, and this is something as an ecofeminist I would want to make quite clear, that if we don't prioritize the world of women's work, the world of the body, the world of the, of the, of the communal work that we tends to come under that title, women's work, there's a danger that economic man will be replaced by ecological man. So what we'll see is men dropping out and doing the old yoga bit. And uh, meanwhile, who is, uh, who is busy still doing all the work? Because if, if, if the gendered nature of human existence isn't recognized, and I think this is a serious problem because I think there's little awareness in the green movement. There's little awareness of if you ha don't have energy sources, you don't have hot water, you don't have sewage systems, um, you don't have uh, refrigeration, all these things you would end up doing away with, then this world of women's work is going to become incredibly, incredibly hard. Think of, think of how your mother or grandmother would have done the washing by hand, grinding things, um, cold water, always cold water, fetching water. Um, I think there's a lack of awareness in the green movement, particularly by male writers, of how hard women's lives, this, well, women's work is going to be. And if the men aren't ready to join in and do it, it's going to be really tough. And if you read books, uh, green, green books, they often talk about an end to alienated work. That is paid work. We don't want to do paid work because that's a waste of everybody's time. And often they, they say, well, if you don't do paid work, what you do then is you have self-fulfillment. You have leisure. You have play. You have craft. No, you don't. You have hard, hard, hard work keeping body, literally keeping body and soul together. Um, because this, this, this world is going to become very, very hard. You see, I'm not a very romantic person. I think you might have noticed that I'm not very romantic. Um, and also, there's this idea of individualized self-production. Everybody's going to dig their own potatoes. Everybody's going to have, make their own food. They're going to sew their own clothes. Um, uh, or, or, or you end up with a, a local idea of local markets, which is all about commodity production. Well, again, from a, from a woman's point of view, of women's work, the, the most important work for, the, for women's work, both in employment and of the activities, certainly for Britain, I don't know if it's true in Poland again, is public services. It's hospitals, it's schools, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's uh, public transport. It's all the things that people need in women's work um, uh, is, is largely to do with public infrastructure. What happens to the elderly? What happens to the very sick? Um, what happens to the old? What happens to the young? And there's, again, there's a romantic idea of everybody digging their own potatoes. But what it, again, much like people in, going into work, what if you're not fit and well enough to do it? How does that work out? So. I don't think the answer, well, a lot of people have the answer, well, let's abandon money. Let's just have subsistence. Let's all grow our own food in happy families. Or let's go back to the horse and the plough and let's, let's get back to how things were. Um, well, that was a hard, hard life, a very hard life. Um, so I don't think it's practical. I don't think it's at all practical to, uh, to think about this kind of local solutions. And, uh, and I know that's an unpopular thing to say in the green movement, but I don't think it's practical. Because we, the majority of people today live in cities. More than 50% of the world live in cities, huge cities. Now, how are we going to decant all those? How are we going to get those out of the cities and all into the countryside? I really don't think that's practical. And also, I've done a lot of study of women's lives in subsistence societies. 
historical ones uh, or existing ones. And it's hard. It's a hard, hard life for women uh, in, in, in those. I mean, for instance, just, just fetching water, just grinding food. It's hard, and I think we've got to be realistic. And dangerous, death in childbirth. What, it's okay having a home birth if you've got a hospital just down around the corner if things go wrong. But in, in olden times, loads of women died in childbirth, or even worse, they would get torn. Uh, the birth would, would, would be so traumatic, they would get torn, so they would become incontinent. And there's a huge problem of incontinence because bodies have been torn. And do you know what I mean by incontinence? Can't control the bladder and the bowel. There's a thing called fistula when the body, internal body is torn so that the great holes open up in, in, in the bowel and in the bladder. And uh, women that ha that happens to are ostracized by their families because they can't control and it's because of difficult births. Uh, and, and it's happened to loads and loads of women, and then they get ostracized. So subs the subsistence economy, historically, was not good for women. So again, I'm not romantic about it. And, um, and I also think that um, the idea of abandoning money doesn't, reali doesn't realize that these earlier societies all had money. So it's not as if they lived without money. Nearly all human societies have had something that is interesting, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, have had some kind of money. So I think the answer should be, let's look at money. Money has always existed in human society, so let's see what we can do with money. Um, I don't think money needs to be linked to exploitation and profit. Certain kinds of money does in certain kinds of society. But money historically didn't have to be like that. It didn't have to be used in markets for profit making. As I say, most human societies have had something that passes for money. Be and what you can do is, you, is use money to recognize provisioning values. In historical societies, money wasn't used for trade. Money was used for things like um, uh, dowries. Um, it was used for, if you've, in, if you've injured somebody, uh, you would have to pay them a certain amount of compensation. And it wasn't done, there was no coinage. It wasn't done like that. What happened was uh, the, 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 the money was just a, a symbol of value. I could say sort of one television set, you know, one speaker. That's, that's my money, that's a speaker. So that's what I call money. Now, you hurt my arm, so I want something equivalent to one speaker from you. You've hurt my leg, I want something equivalent to two speakers from you. It doesn't mean to say you give me a speaker. What you do is you say, well, in that case, can I give you this cloth? Can I give you this goat? Um, uh, can, can, I, can I help you rebuild your house? And do you think that's about right for one speaker? or two speakers. So money has been not, it's not been a physical thing through a lot of history, it's just been a means of calculation to compare um, gifts, dowries, um, uh, how, much, how much will you have to pay, do you, you know, three speakers worth? So, okay, that's two goats, a couple of coats, um, and so you go on. So money has been used historically um, so it has had physical forms sometimes, but it's mainly been used to compare different values. And, uh, and I think that's how we should use money in modern society. We could, should use it to compare different values, not to invest to make profits. I think that is a, that is a, 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 a limited use of money, and it doesn't recognise how other, uh, other money could be done. So I think that that's the most practical way to do it. So what I would recommend, most money now in modern societies is tend to be thought of in the marketplace where trade is done in order to uh, increase, uh, is to make profit. That is the modern capitalist way of running a society. That is, you, you use money to do some kind of commercial activities and then you hope at the end to get more money back. So less money at some point makes more money. 
I, I don't see any reason why we have, we have to have the profit element in it. Why can't we use money, as they did in earlier human societies, just to um, make something happen? And you end up with the same amount of money. It's just used as a convenience. And if you're running, think if, you, if you've got to run a big society, you know, uh, I don't know how many people you've got in Poland, but quite a few, quite a few uh, million, I'm quite sure. Um, you, you can do it on a market basis, but the market is the thing that's actually producing economic man, producing um, uh, inefficient levels of, uh, of use of resources. You could go to, uh, uh, you could try and break it into local, local economies, but as I said before, I don't think that's practical uh, for a big, heavily uh, populated society. You could go to some kind of national planning. Well, I think you've, uh, your history, you've had national planning. I doubt that's popular. Um, so I think a way of, of involving everybody in provisioning, but on a more equal basis, is to use money but use money uh, as, a, as a means of, of, of having a flexible system of production and consumption that we keep within, within limits and make sure everybody gets involved. So I think we should be looking to organise money for use value. So I think we should redefine money and, uh, and uh, think of the, the way in modern societies we're taught to think of money is just money is a bit of a commodity that is invested to make money, to get more money. We, we all go to get, get our wages because we try and, uh, and, 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 and buy what we can. So most of us use money as use value. Most of us aren't investing money to make money. We're just doing something and getting paid and then going to buy what we need. Why do you have to have a profit motive in that? Why can't we just... Um, make our contribution to society, get recognised by earning some money through that, and then use that money uh, to, uh, to, to go and get the goods and services we want. It, 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 why does somebody somewhere have to make money out of that? I, I, I don't know why. So I would want to have a money system based around use value. I won't go into definitions there because it would take too long. Now, this is an example of local money, uh, where people are doing this. This is the Bristol Pound, in Bristol City in, in Britain, that uh, now, uh, that's just introduced its own local currency. Now, this has been tried over and over and over again, in local currencies. I don't know if you've had any local currencies in Poland, but, uh, but uh, the, it's been tried a lot in America, uh, during the 1930s, there were loads of them uh, all, all over Europe, a um, particularly notable one in Austria. Um, uh, the only trouble with them is that uh, they're people setting up local currencies themselves uh, and deciding to trade using a local currency. Um, the problem is that it, it, it doesn't really deal with the depth of provisioning. It tends to be... Um, I, I, I'll do some knitting for you and you'll do a bit of gardening for me and I'll give you a massage and, uh, 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 and you can perhaps walk my dog. It's sort of, um, it's not the, the important things of life. So I think what you've got to do is not to, uh, not to criticise the local money systems, but I do think that we've got to get a much bigger form of use value money and that is what I call public money. Um, I'll just, stop, just look at the bottom there of social money. Um, I think this is what the, uh, the, these are the kinds of things that are happening at the local level where people are setting up local money alter, uh, as alternative currency or local exchange trading schemes or time banks. Have you, are you familiar with any of those things? So I, Now, I'm not saying those are bad ideas but I don't think they can get us very far because they, they can't deal with the big populations, almost by definition. So I think, I'll, I'll leave that. Um, I've, so I think what we've got to do is to think in terms of public money, money at a bigger scale. Now, money at the moment, um, uh, the commodity money is, uh, is unsustainable 
because um, it, it is goal oriented to profit motive and investment for profit motive. I'm going to skip this because it's going to take too long. What people are not aware of at the moment is where modern money comes from. Now, if, if you just think for a moment, where do you think money comes from? Just, just think in, in, in your heads. I mean, I know you, 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 you get, get it when you earn money or you, but where does it come from originally? And most people just, just don't know, really don't know where it comes from. So this is the first, and most economists don't know where it comes from either. And politicians certainly don't know where it comes from. Um, now, there's only two places money can come from. That is, it could be produced by public organizations, either states, treasuries, or central banks, or it can come from commercial banks. Now, I think, this, now, I think people will you'll now think, well, no, I, did I know that? Now, you probably, in the end, would now you've thought about it, think, well, yes, I can understand that states and central banks produce money because that's the, the public organization. But are you aware that banks create money? Commercial banks? Good. Because in modern uh, societies, the production of money has been largely privatized. Now, I don't know what the situation is in Poland, the balance between public money and private money. Uh, the private uh, issue of money. I, d I don't know what the difference is. Now, how do, how do banks create money? Um, let's go back to this again. Public money take, can take many forms. Um, it can be coins. And the public, uh, public authorities, ruling authorities, have nearly always in all societies controlled coinage. So when uh, your economics textbooks tell you that coinage emerged in trade. It's not true. It's always been a public um, system. And usually in most societies, only the, only the public monetary organizations or the state itself can produce notes, bank notes. Um, a more recent form of money that has been produced in the, in the, in the financial crisis is what they call quantitative easing which is putting a lot of money into the commercial banks to try and rescue them in the crash. Um, you, I, I, anybody heard of that concept? Yeah, good. Now, how do banks create money? Well, they're not allowed to mint coins. They're not allowed to uh, print, in most cases, they're not allowed to print the national currency or the euro currency if you were in Euroland. Um, they're not, uh, they won't be quantitatively easing because that's the money used to rescue them. Well, they can't produce the money that's used to rescue them. I mean, so the only way a bank, a commercial bank, can produce new money is by, um, is by giving you uh, some money in your bank account. So if you went for a loan to buy a car or something, if you could afford such things, um, the bank would make you a loan and would open uh, and would put some money into your bank account, which obviously you have to pay back. Um, and that money, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't give you notes, it doesn't give you coin unless you ask for it. It gives you, it gives you some numbers in your bank account that you can trade with. So that's what that was meant to represent, a checkbook. I don't know how many people use, do we use checkbooks anymore? I could put a bank card in. I think in Poland you're using bank cards a lot, aren't you? You're using debit and credit cards. So you've almost, you're, in that case, your system of money has almost entirely been privatized. Uh, it's only if you're using notes and coin that you're using public money. Right, so um, now the problem with this, you say, well, okay, well, what, what's the problem with this? Well, the problem with this is that all new money coming into, into, the, into the commercial side of society comes in as debt. Banks don't give you money. You have to borrow it. And, um, and, but the trouble is, it's not produced as the responsibility of the bank. Because when it cre creates these new numbers in your bank account, they're designated, they're called slotties. They're not Citibank's notes. They're not Citibank's coins. They're not Citibank account. They are 
the public currency. And this is why we get into crisis and why we've had this dreadful crisis is because the majority of our money now, certainly in Britain, it's 97% of our new money, 97% of our new money only comes into our economy through the commercial banks as loans. Now, if people stop taking loans or stop repaying their loans, you have a crisis in your money supply, which is exactly what the crisis has been. And the only response then is for the public economy, the public sector, to pump huge amounts of public money into the commercial sector and um, uh, uh, to rescue the banks. To s try and, and all they're trying to do in that crisis, of, uh, trying to meet this crisis, is trying to pump enough new money into the commercial banking system to get the lending going again. They don't care about people needing money. They don't care about people needing bread or houses or hospitals. All they want is to get the commercial system back on the road again. And, and, yet, and at the same time, the states are getting punished for doing it with austerity. They're saying, well, you've put so much money into your banking sector, you now have to uh, cut all your public services and everything until you've balanced it up. I mean, it's absolutely, it's absolutely cruel. So, what's my solution? My solution, um, the problem with the modern version of privatised money, and I don't know how far you've, you've gone in, in Poland down this path, I don't know how much of the money circulating in your economy comes entirely through bank debt, uh, because the, I don't know what the proportions would be. But the problem, why, it's all, why it goes into crisis is because the banks always put less money into the economy than they want back. Because if you think about it, what do they want back when they've lent you money? They want the money they've lent you back and they want interest as well. So the system is always unstable because the, the, that system is always putting less money into the economy than it wants back. It's a tr that is a complete difference between the public money system the public money system always puts more money into the economy than it asks for back. And how does it ask for it back? It asks for it back through taxation. So, so it, uh, it spends, lends, or allocates money into the economy, at the moment, only to the financial sector. It's putting, America has put $29 trillion into its financial sector just like that, all well, over the years. Um, and pu the public economy is always putting more into the economy than it asks for back. This is called a deficit, and, and people go crazy about it, but it's absolutely essential. So my solution is quite a simple one. Why do we let the banks control our money supply based on profit? Why do we do that? Why don't we... Uh, say that the banks can't create more money. If they want to lend money, they must get people to deposit money with them, that they, people's savings, that they can lend out. And if you read a textbook, if you read an economics textbook, it will say that. It will say, banks take in deposits and then lend them out to borrowers. It's a lie. It's a lie. They don't. They create new money. So why don't we say a bank can only lend money that it's taken in? And the person who's, who's deposited the money will just have to wait until the person pays it back, until they can get their money back. And why don't we put money issue, new money issue, new money circulation, directly into the economy for the needs of the people? Like the Bristol Pound is launching the Bristol Pound to circulate in the local economy. So why don't we reclaim the money from the banks and create an issue money and circulate it to ourselves on a sustainable basis. I think, mon therefore, I think money should be seen as a commons, something that is a right of every one of us. Because we all participate in society, we all have needs, we're all part of the provisioning process. So why can't money be seen as something which is a social mechanism and it's a, resource, it's a social resource that we all have a right to, like we have a right to air and a right to water. 
why don't we make money for us? And we can think about this in terms of things like citizen income, where we, people can have a right to livelihood, um, either as a citizen income which they can spend or a right to meaningful work so they can earn money to spend. Um, in, in that case, the way we would issue money would be on a provisioning basis. So everybody would have equal access, whether you're young, you're old, you're sick, uh, you're, you're, you have disabilities. You'd have a right to your allocation. And we, that means we'd have to start redefining wealth. Wealth isn't about money accumulation, pounds in the bank or slotties in the bank. Wealth is to do with the social quality of your life, um, the, your public services, the uh, sustainability of your ecology. That is what we should be defining as wealth, not money accumulation. So therefore, I think we should open a democratic debate on how money is entering your economy. It's up to you to do it for Poland. You have to know how, mu how is money entering your economy? What proportion of it is coming in, in through the commercial banking system as debt? Is that what people want? Um, or, pe or do people want money created and allocated for more social purposes? Um, and then we can put the money into needs-led provisioning, the services we need, public infrastructure. We could put the money into community and specialist banks, um, not-for-profit organizations and production, people to have a basic income. Or we could allocate an income for nature. We could give nature some money as of right that, people, that can be used to sustain it and preserve it. So this is my last slide. I think we should start thinking about, very consciously, about the money system. It's our national money system. This isn't local money system. This is our public currency. What do we want to have that money for? How do we want to use it? How do we want to issue it? How do we want to circulate it? On what priorities? On what basis? And uh, I think, therefore, we should be arguing for our money systems to reflect the needs of the people and the planet. And, uh, 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 and that is the way we would have sustainable provisioning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Miller. I think it was a very interesting lecture. And you, you introduced uh, concepts that I think are, are new for many people here. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, but there, I, I think that there are some questions that like merge quite naturally here. Um, uh, for example, well, if if we'd like to make money, public resource, as you uh, suggest um, and as you propose, so how how can we do that, and how can we make it really demo democratic? Because um, basic questions are who decides and mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. and what, what would be the, the procedure? Yeah. So how do, can you imagine it? Yeah. Um, don't mind if I sit down now because I'm a bit, <laughs> a bit tired. Um, well, the, 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 it, it, if you talk about how can money be allocated, it, it, it seems as if it's a, um, an unreasonable thing to say until you think about, well, how is it created and allocated at the moment? And um, uh, it, 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 people don't realize that money has to be created. It, somebody somewhere or some organization, all the money that's in your bank accounts or in your pockets, an, an action had to be taken at some point for that money to be created. And there's only two organizations that can create it commercial banks on commercial debt or public organizations. Now, once you realize there's only two sources of money that you can have, then the question then comes, well, what, what would you give priority to? Would you give it to public borrowing, uh, sorry, commercial borrowing, or would you give it to public use, public creation and public use? That's the first thing. 
I'm, in, in, I'm coming to answer the question, but you've got to have your mind set. Otherwise, it doesn't seem... You've got to know what's happening now and get angry about it before you can start seeing how practical it is to do it a different way. Because what has happened in Britain, we have had completely unregulated, like I say, 97% of our money has come through us through commercial debt. And nearly all of that has been borrowed by the financial sector to speculate. It's something like they have issued six times GDP, six times GDP just into the financial sector. That is six times the amount of money that the GDP is worth is sitting in the financial sector as debt. And, uh, and that's how unstable we are. Um, personal debt is about 140% of GDP. Uh, government debt is about 80% of GDP. But the big, big, big borrowers have been the, the, the financial sector speculators. Now, when you know that's what's happening to money in your economy, and they're, getting, they're paying themselves bonus, they're paying themselves in the millions of pounds, the millions. Now, when, when you realize that that's what's going on in an extreme society like Britain, where we've let the banks completely control our money supply, then, it's very, then you understand how you really want to ask, well, look, do we have to do it that way? By what right do these people borrow all this money and speculate? So once you've, once you've sort of got that, you say, right, well, and we know that when the, this system gets in a mess, the public sector has to create money to rescue it in huge quantities. So uh, now the public sector always created money in the past. Um, your society will probably, because you've got your own currency, probably there's some balance between. It, up until about the 1970s, it was about 15% of our money was still created and circulated publicly. That is, it was, it was created and used by the, by the, by the state in various ways. Um, now... Um, that means that money is being put into the economy in various ways, say in the health service. Um, and it, it, because the, the government doesn't ask for all that money back again, in fact, that is the money that feeds the profit of the, of the commercial sector because the commercial sector always wants more money than it gave out. So it needs a public source of money if you have the public sector. So it is perfectly possible and has always been historically possible for the public sector to create money. It's always been able to create money and use it as it wants. Now in past history, it was mainly used for war. Um, the first person to use a lot of money uh, for war was Alexander the Great in 300 BC. He needed half a ton of silver a day to pay his soldiers to launch his empire. Now, so, so it's perfectly possible for um, uh, ruling, ruling um, uh, well, rulers to produce public money and circulate it. So what we've got to get our head in is it's perfectly possible to do it. The question then becomes how do you do it and who do you give the money to and on what basis? Most people wouldn't want to say the state can print what it wants, can create whatever money it wants and do what it wants because most people are suspicious of the state. So I think you should, uh, the, the, the issue of money, a creation and issue of money into, the, uh, into a society itself should be a matter of democratic debate in terms of what proportions of money should go to what kinds of organizations. So I think we should have a monetary budget, say a five-year budget, which is how much new money is going to be created in our, in our society over the next five years. And who and what organizations should be entitled to use any of that money. Now, some of it would be allocated to the commercial sector because the commercial sector would still exist and would still need new sources of money. Uh, another one might be to the public services, public infrastructure. But another one might be to, say, a, a specialist banks like housing banks or agricultural banks. Um, another one might be to um, uh, not-for-profit um, community structures. So I think, uh, so my suggestion is that money supply, new money, money supply 
into a society needs to be a matter of democratic debate. Politicians, when they're putting up for government, should put up monetary budgets. And the, and the, but the money isn't for them. The money isn't for them when they become the government. The, the money is to be allocated, um, for, for instance, a, a, a pen, for pensions. It could be allocated as pensions. It could be allocated to uh, home-based women who are doing childcare, um, who don't have an income at the moment. Um, it could be a basic income. I think it's, it would be up to political movements to put forward a money supply budget and then people could vote on it and effectively they'd be voting on which organisations in society should actually have access to new money. And, uh, and that, that would be how I would put um, democratic participation into the system. Now one part of that money would be allocated to the state for public expenditure but only one part. And that, so that's how I would see it happening, a monetary budget. So it would be quite similar to participatory, participatory budgeting yes, in a, on, a on the level of the scale. city. Like, on a national but, scale. But it's on a yeah. national scale. And I would argue that once, you'd, once uh, people had voted on, a, on, on the budget, uh, presumably when it comes to an election, um, di different movements would put forward different budgets, so people would need to be offered alternatives, otherwise they're not voting, are they? Um, but once a budget has been put in place, I think it, would be, it should be made quite hard to change it, because otherwise um, people might put unrealistic budgets in and then think, oh, well, we'll change it later. We'll, just put a, we'll put one in that everybody will like, and then a year later we'll change it. I think if you put a budget forward, it should be at least five years. Uh, I will give the floor to the audience in, a, in a one minute or two. Uh, but I first wanted to, um, to raise the issue I could be called um, environmentalist concern because I think that there is a risk that people would still, or people generally would still pursue economic growth that is not mm -hmm. uh, ecologically sustainable with this public money. Uh, of course, it would be more beneficial than now w when it is dry, driven by market forces, but still, it wouldn't necessarily be uh, no. sustainable. No. You need, alongside uh, the changing in the money system, democratizing the money system, you need to have lots of regulations about the use of resources, tax on resources. So, but the point at the moment is you can't put all these things in because people say, well, oh, well, you, you'll frighten the companies away, you'll frighten investors away. So if you try to put uh, environmental regulation in under the present system, you're blackmailed effectively um, by them saying, well, well, we'll go and we'll take our production somewhere else, we'll take it somewhere where it's easier. Um, whereas if you, and, and the reason we have to put up with these companies who are doing damage is because we need them to employ people and we need them to provide if we can get any taxes out of them. But if you had your own money system, which you were doing the things you needed to do anyway, then you don't need these destructive companies. When they threaten to leave and go somewhere else, they will go. We'll do it ourselves. We've got the money, we've got the resources, we'll do, the, we'll, we'll do it sustainably ourselves as, 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 a, as a country. And we won't be blackmailed by these private companies. If we have enough capital, like resources. You've got as much money as you want. As long as, as long as you balance the amount of money in people's hands with the amount of investment you put into the goods and services you're going to offer, um, then as long as that's in balance, you haven't got a problem. Um, the, 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 the way it works at the moment, if, you, if all your money supply is created by the private sector in for profit, mainly for profit ways, then the only way you can raise money for public use is by taxing that sector, and they don't like being taxed. Partly, understandably, because if they're borrowing most of the money and then have to repay it with interest, they haven't got that much money left to pay taxes. Um, whereas if you issue your own money, you don't need to worry about taxes except to stop inflation. So if you've got a public money issue, a public money creation, what you need then is a budget for taxation that allows you to reclaim a good proportion of the money 
so that it doesn't flood the market with too, too much money. So you don't um, set taxes to raise money for public expenditure. You spend the money and then you claim the money back as taxation in order to take money out of the economy for the free goods and services you've given people, say a free health service, if you've got a free health service, I don't know, free education system. Well, people have to pay for that, don't they? So they have to give the money back uh, for the free goods they've had via, via a tax system. It's much more uh, politically acceptable for people to, for you to ask money back from them they've already had in goods and services than it is to ask them to pay taxes for the goods and services because they think, I can't afford it. I haven't got enough money. I can't afford my taxes. Whereas if you say, we've created the money, you've had your goods, you've had your education system, you've had your, um, your sustainable environment, you've had your health service. Now, a lot of that money we spent on all that, we've got to have back now. And I think it's, it's psychologically, it's a very different way of looking at money. Okay. I have some more questions, but first I will uh, give uh, possibility to, for you to, to ask questions. Uh, 